Did you know that my brother set the Blackwater Rush afire? Wildfire will burn on water. Ares would have bathed in it if he dared. The Targaryens were all mad for fire. He saw traitors everywhere, and Varys was always there to point out any he might have missed. So his grace commanded his alchemists to place caches of wildfire all over King's Landing, beneath Baylor's Sept and the hovels of Flea Bottom, under stables and storehouses. At all seven gates, even in the cellars of the Red Keep itself, everything was done in the utmost secrecy by a handful of master pyromancers. They did not even trust their own acolytes to help. The Queen's eyes had been closed for years, and Rhaegar was busy marshalling an army. But Aerys's new mace and dagger hand was not utterly stupid, and with Rosart, Bellis and Gargus coming and going night and day, he became suspicious. Chelsted, that was his name. Lord Chelsted. I thought the man craven, but the day he confronted Aerys he found some courage somewhere. He did all he could to dissuade him. He reasoned, he jested, he threatened, and finally he begged. When that failed, he took off his chain of office and flung it down on the floor. Aerys burned him alive for that, and hung his chain about the neck of Rosard, his favorite pyromancer. The man who had cooked Lord Rickard Stark in his own armor. And all the time I stood by the foot of the Iron Throne in my white plate, still as a corpse, guarding my leech and his sweet secrets. He remembered how Rosard's eyes would shine when he unrolled his maps to show where the substance must be placed. Gargus and Bellis were the same. The traitors won my city, I heard him tell Rosard. But I will give them not by ashes. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. The Targaryens never bury their dead. They burn them. Aerys meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though, if truth be told, I do not believe he was truly expected to die. Like Aerion bright fire before him, Aerys thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn his enemies to ash. I sent to Aerys asking his leave to make terms. My men came back with a royal command. Bring me your father's head, if you are no traitor. Aerys would have no yielding. Lord Rosard was with him, my messenger said. I knew what that meant. When I came on Rosard, he was dressed as a common man at arms, hurrying to a poster gate. I slew him first. Then I slew Aerys, before he could find someone else to carry his message to the pyromancers. Days later, I hunted down the others and slew them as well. Bellis offered me gold, and Gargus wept for mercy. Well, a sword's more merciful than fire, but I don't think Gargus much appreciated the kindness I showed him. Being a citizen of King's Landing is like living atop a faulty nuclear reactor. Aerys Targaryen, who had been mad for years, ordered his pyromancers to put wildfire, a liquid, highly flammable substance, underneath all of King's Landing and set it on fire at the site of his imminent loss during Robert's Rebellion. Jaime Lannister killed him in order to prevent that from happening, but the wildfire has been hidden beneath the city for years now. It would seem like the disaster had been averted, but has it? You probably heard the term Chekhov's gun, named after a brilliant short story writer, Anton Chekhov. According to Chekhov, if there's a certain element introduced in the story, it has to be utilized later. In a Zoyav, the gun in question is a fantasy equivalent of napalm. No small thing at all. So suffice to say, the wildfire still sitting beneath King's Landing should serve some narrative purpose. That means King's Landing is gonna burn either way. Chekhov's wildfire, if you will. In the show adaptation of the story, the wildfire was somewhat forgotten though. While Cersei did blow up the Sept of Baelor, the final destruction of the city came from Daenerys and her last remaining dragon. Once she heard the bells, something in her snapped and she burned the city. That seemed like a curious narrative choice, especially when you consider that three seasons before, fans of the books were puzzled by the omission of several characters, very important ones, including one who has a trauma related to the sound of the bells. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. In his youth, John Connington was Rhaegar Targaryen's close friend. 
When Robert's rebellion broke out, the Connectons of the Griffin's Roost remained loyal to the Targaryens and John was even named as Aerys's Hunt. John Con was a commander during the Battle of the Bells in Stony Sept. Robert Baratheon, a central figure to the entire conflict, was hiding in that town and John did all he could to find him, but he slipped from his grasp. Shortly afterwards, Robert defeated Rhaegar on the Trident, which cemented the loss of Targaryen loyalists. For his failure in the Stony Sept, Aerys stripped John of his lordship and sent him into exile. Most believe that John drank himself to death out of grief, but in A Dance with Dragons, we learn that John is very much alive. He joined the Golden Company and rose in its ranks, but the failure of the Stony Sept haunts him to this day. Initially, John believed that he did what he could to root out the rebellious lord, but when he confined about this to his friend Miles Toyne, he had this to say. Tywin Lannister himself could have done no more. He had insisted one night to Blackheart, during his first year of exile. There is where you're wrong, Miles Toyne had replied. Lord Tywin would not have bothered with a search. He would have burned the town and every living creature in it. Men and boys, babes of the breast, noble knights and holy septons, pigs and horse, rats and rebels. He would have burned them all. When the fires guttered out and only ash and cinders remained, he would have sent his men in to find the bones of Robert Baratheon. Later, when Stark and Tully turned up with their host, he would have offered pardons to both of them, and they would have accepted and turned for home with their tails beneath their legs. John was led to believe that had he been ruthless enough and put the town to torch, Robert would have died here and there and the rebellion would have been squandered. The sound of the bells that rang that day in the Stony Sept remind him of this failure. Seventeen years had come and gone since the Battle of the Bells, yet the sound of bells ringing still tight and not in his guts. Others might claim that the realm was lost when Prince Rhaegar fell to Robert's warhammer on the Trident, but the Battle of the Trident would never have been fought if the Griffin had only slain the stack there in Stony Sept. The bells sold for all of us that day, for Aerys and his queen, for Elia of Dorne and her little daughter, for every true man and honest woman in the Seven Kingdoms, and for my silver prince. The road ahead was full of perils, he knew, but what of it? All men must die. All he asked was time. He had waited so long. Surely the gods would grant him a few more years. Enough time to see the boy he had called a son seated on the Iron Throne. To reclaim his lands, his name, his honor. To steal the bells that rang so lightly in his dreams whenever he closed his eyes to sleep. But it would seem that perhaps John has a chance of redemption. He learns that Rhaegar's son Aegon survived the sack of King's Landing and he was tasked to take him under his wing and nurture him so that one day the boy might regain his rightful legacy. He promises himself that this time he shall stop at nothing to ensure it. I failed the father, he said, but I will not fail the son. This entire storyline was omitted from the show. The sound of the bells was a trigger for Daenerys, even though she never had any negative connotations related to it. If anything, Danny should have positive thoughts regarding bells, since the Dothraki wear little bells in their hair as a symbol of victory, though that aspect was omitted from the show as well. The sound of the bells ringing is a thing very specific to John, but rather than omit it altogether due to his absence from the show, it was given to Daenerys. If Chekhov's bells were included in spite of John's omission from the show, they must be an important plot point. It is fair to assume that the bells shall ring in the books as well. And if John Connington is there, what will be his reaction to the sound that represents everything that was taken away from him? Given how bitterly he regrets not putting down Stony Sep to torch, could it be that he will not want to repeat that mistake in King's Landing? Interestingly, even in the show canon, the bells do not mean surrender. I have always hated the bells. They ring for horror. A dead king, a city under siege. A wedding. Exactly. But in the books, the bells also ring in a very specific context, when the Battle of the Blackwater is won. So if the bells ring in King's Landing, it might signal John Con's siege, or his defeat. The history repeats itself again and John Con fails the son like he failed the father. And when he hears the sound he so despises, he might realize that he cannot resort to half measures, that if the city must burn, then so be it. What he does not know is what Aerys Targaryen's last order was. <laughs> Question is, who will be ringing the bells in King's Landing when John Con hears them and snaps? The most likely candidate seems to be Cersei. Varys kills her uncle Kevin in the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons so that Cersei feels the power vacuum and continues the instability in King's Landing. Chaos is a ladder, if you will. 
Cersei is not the type of person to surrender to whoever will attack the city. And it just so happens that, like every Stargarian, Cersei has a particular devotion to wildfire and is compared to the man numerous times. Jaime curled up beneath his clock, hoping to dream of Cersei. But when he closed his eyes, it was every Stargarian he saw, pacing alone in his throne room, picking at his cupped and bleeding hands. Even in the baleful glow, Cersei had been beautiful to look upon. She'd stood with one hand on her breast, her lips parted, her green eyes shining. She is crying, Jamie had realized, but whether it was from grief or ecstasy, he could not have said. The sight had filled him with disquiet, reminding him of every Targaryen and the way a burning would arouse him. If these flames spread beyond the tower, you might end up burning down a castle, whether you mean it or not. Wildfire is treacherous. Lord Hallen has assured me that his pyromancers can control the fire. The guild of alchemists had been brewing fresh wildfire for a fortnight. Let all of King's Landing see the flames. It will be a lesson to our enemies. Now you sound like Aerys. Westeros is torn and bleeding, and I do not doubt that even now my sweet sister is binding up the wounds with salt. Cersei is as gentle as King Maegor, as selfless as Aegon the Unworthy, as wise as Mad Aerys. There's also this very nice passage in A Clash of Kings. The queen was drinking heavily, but the wine only seemed to make her more beautiful. Her cheeks were flushed, and her eyes had a bright feverish heat to them as she looked down over the hall. Eyes of wildfire, Sansa thought. After Cersei's walk of shame, Kevin thinks to himself. Sir Kevin could not remember ever seeing his niece so quiet, so subdued, so demure. All for the good, he supposed. But it made him sad as well. Her fire is quenched, she who used to burn so bright. Here is another parallel between Cersei and Aerys. Cersei was already paranoid, vindictive and cruel before her walk of shame, but the experience psychologically broke her. Similarly, Aerys was already paranoid, vindictive and cruel, but what truly started his descent into villainy and madness was his captivity at Duskendale. Little does Kevin know that Cersei is anything but quiet, subdued and demure, and she who burns so bright shall burn even brighter than he could have ever expected her to. Cersei's humiliation during the walk of shame can be cleansed for her if, well, everyone who ever saw it dies in the explosion. Jaime Lannister, in an ironic twist of fate, is revived for his most heroic act. He killed Aerys to prevent him from carrying out his plans to burn King's Landing with wildfire. Could it be that history is about to repeat and Jaime will have to stop Cersei from a similar act, only this time it will be too late? As a young girl, Cersei had a prophecy about a Valonqar killing her. This word translates to little brother in Valyrian and Cersei always assumed that it refers to Tyrion. But Jaime is in fact several minutes younger than Cersei. He too could be the Valonqar. Jaime believes that just like they arrived to the world together, they will leave it together. And all while John Connington is outside the walls, hearing the sound of the bells once more. These people all gathered in the same place, with wildfire hidden beneath King's Landing, are a recipe for a major disaster. <laughs> In spite of all this, the most common prediction for the winds of winter is that Danny will be the one to burn King's Landing. Theories such as this one have been prevalent even before the show seemingly confirmed it. It seems like her last chapter in A Dance with Dragons only cements it. After spending an entire book trying to compromise with the slaving elite, Danny chooses to embrace her house words, fire and blood. Gone are the days of Danny trying to keep the peace, it's all violence, fire and terror now. And for that she has to be duly punished. Because violence, fire and terror are only okay if it's done by other characters. What's curious is that initially the target of Danny's fire was something different. The Water Gardens, a children's retreat in Dorne. But when George R. R. Martin heard of this theory, his comment was, uh, no. And this is a guy who is usually quite elusive when it comes to fan theories. So because it could not be the Water Gardens, a different location had to be picked. King's Landing seemed like a perfect choice. It was Danny's father who left the white fire beneath the city, would it not serve as such a narrative irony for her to be one to set it off? Various predictions give different degrees of responsibility for that act. Some insist that Danny will firebomb the city with no remorse just like she did in the show, others offer a more toned down version of events in which she does so by accident, since she does not know about the wildfire plot, but the resulting carnage will be her responsibility anyway. It would seem like this is a more sympathetic prediction, but in a way it is more sinister. Danny accidentally burning King's Landing would mean that she would be punished for the actions of other people. She would be punished for her father's insanity, 
and his order to place the substance underneath the city. She would be punished for the actions of Rosart and other pyromancers who carried that order out. And she would be punished for Jamie not doing anything to remove the wildfire. Jamie is one of the very few people who know about this whole ordeal. Maybe the only one. All the citizens of King's Landing are unaware that they live on a nuclear bomb. This state of things is hazardous, even when Dragonfire isn't involved. And the fire in King's Landing risks setting off the chain reaction, and it's nothing short of a miracle that it hasn't happened yet. While Jamie did hunt the other pyromancers who knew of these plans, he never informed anyone else, never made efforts to remove it or evacuate the population. Danny never knew of these plans, never intended for them to be carried out, never would have used dragon fire if she knew, yet it will happen because she is a daughter of a madman she never knew. This seems like cruelty for the sake of cruelty, for her to be punished for something she did not intend to do, for something she had no idea about, for the negligence and insanity of other people. Not to mention that Danny would have to essentially teleport to King Zanding just to carry out the deed, and she has quite a lot of things to do in Essos. Going to Vice Dothrak, uniting the Dothraki, returning to Mirin, lifting the siege, dealing with slavers, going to Volantis, going to Pantos. But yeah, I'm sure she will appear just in time to nuke the city and John Con and Cersei will just stand idly. <laughs> John Connington regrets not burning down a city when he had a chance. Cersei is repeatedly compared to Aerys and is obsessed with wildfire. And yet, the most common prediction is that Danny will teleport to King's Landing and burn it down by accident. This prediction relies on completely ignoring those two characters or reducing them to just being present without doing anything. Even the TV show that cut John Con specifically to make Daenerys the one to burn King's Landing gave her John Con's biggest trigger. If Danny is the one to burn King's Landing, the conclusion to her character would be that she lived in misery and died in misery, always paying for the mistakes of other people and always bearing the brunt of punishment for the actions of others, just like she paid for Drago's pillage with the life of her child. If Danny is the one to burn King's Landing, all of her arc of learning how to rule will be squandered. And if Danny is the one to burn King's Landing, the only way she could cleanse herself of this terrible sin is to die, of course. It seems like her corpse is necessary for the happiness and fulfillment of every other character in this story, and this prediction is one of the many examples of such thinking. After all, what is the life of one teenage ex-bridal slave against everyone else? Let her commit an atrocity by accident and die so that everyone else is content and happy. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Thank you.